Welcome back, everybody. This is another episode of the Exodus Project. I'm your host, Steve Eisenhower, and joined with me today um, on audio call is Joseph Atwell, author of Caesar's Messiah, available in the description. Um, he's been on with us before. Always have excellent conversations. Um, if you would, please check that description. Purchase the book, Caesar's Messiah, on YouTube as well. Um, but Joseph, how are you doing today? I'm just fine, Steve. How are you? I'm doing well, doing well. Thanks. Um, so as everyone I'm sure who watches my channel knows Caesar's Messiah, you know, quite a hypothesis. I think it's pretty rock solid. Um, we've spoken about it before today. We're going to kind of shift gears a little bit and touch on some things we didn't touch on so much last time um to see if we can tease out a little bit more of these christian origins so my first topic my first question i want to really talk about the gospels what the word gospel is in greek um evangelion or good news of war right so as i ponder about that you know, reading Caesar's Messiah, listening to the documentary, uh, we understand the the parallel between the campaign of um, Vespasian, Titus, and the ministry of Jesus. Um, so as Titus, as the main character, conquers Israel, what I found very interesting with Jesus's name is that Yehoshua ben Nun conquered Israel. You see a lot of overlays, a lot of parallels, and Yehoshua in Greek is Jesus, right? Just like Jesus. So in your opinion, and we can tease this out some more, do you think that name was chosen for a purpose? Uh, Jesus? Yes. Um, yes, it's a, it's a typological name. Um, it, it can be translated as Savior. Sure. And so the name Jesus Christ is not really grammatically coherent because um, it's not a name you would you would or historically coherent because it's not a name you would give to a child. I mean, it's obviously just something that was ascribed to the individual after the fact right. um, to uh, to point out that this is the Christ and this is also the Savior. Um, the to understand the word, uh, I would suggest people simply read the analysis that I do in the beginning of Caesar's Messiah mm -hmm. regarding the um, typology that looks backwards from Jesus's ministry. In other words, you have um, uh, Moses being used as uh, basically as a foreshadowing of, sure. of Jesus. All right. And Moses was the first savior of Israel. All right. So what what you're doing with um, the the backward looking typology um, is identifying uh, Jesus as a new Moses or a new savior. Right. So this would be, you know, the kind of the literary basis for the name is that the character is a is is being given to the reader as a savior He's going to save Israel or the mm -hmm. Jewish people from their sins uh, are, and from their trials and tribulations. He's a savior. Um, right. And he's also called the Christ because he is, uh, you know, the anointed um, uh, one in the lineage of David. So he's going to be basically the king or the governor of the Jews who has a connection, a divine connection to God like mm -hmm. David did. And right. he's also uh, representing himself as a new Moses. He's, he's you know, the... The events of his pre-ministry were structured uh, as uh, typologically linking into um, the events in, uh, that are described in Exodus concerning Moses. So the alert reader is just being told right off the bat in the first 10 right. pages of the, of the New Testament that he, this individual is, you know, has the hand of God upon him. Mm -hmm. He is going to create um, a new covenant. This is, of course, the the controversial part of the character of Jesus Christ, that he's here to really uh, bring an end to the first covenant, the one that God right. made with Moses and established a new covenant 
um, specifically between God and the Romans. Um, yeah, right. So, so this is, uh, you know, in, in this historical era, this is very suspicious because Rome is battling against a rebellious Messianic movement mm-hmm. uh, that is recorded as being inspired by the uh, Messianic prophecies of the Jewish religion. So in that historical moment, suddenly out pops the Gospels, uh, which says, no, where these prophecies are relating not to a, a military leader, someone mm-hmm. who would be following the lineage of David, but someone who's doing just the opposite, someone who's advocating peace with the Romans, cooperation with the Romans. Um, and so you you have to wonder, I mean, it's just a natural reaction to the Gospels, if you understand the history of the era, is, is this simply propaganda? Is right. this just Roman propaganda to diminish the uh, the power uh, of of the messianic prophecies and of the uh, of the Torah to mm-hmm. to to help promote rebellion against the Roman Empire? Right, right. So when when I see these things, also, and you know, brilliant answer. I think that I think that's really in line with what I was asking. But this connection with Yehoshua, I can't help but. You know, you see from you see from your book, they're they're kind of, I guess you could say, covering up the war idea, right? Covering up Titus's campaign. Yeah. Um, so you have Yehoshua, right? Who's the or Joshua? I guess I should use that name for viewers who might not know who I'm talking about. Joshua, like the successor of Moses, the prophet like Moses, he experienced miracles and conquered the Holy Land, right? Yeah. You have like a new Joshua, and he's like the super cedar of Moses and is very anti-conquest now he's all about peace so i think to a a jewish audience i think that might be another because if we take the propaganda route then you're trying to give a new judaism to jews right that kind of like fits in a roman framework yeah you're absolutely right and what they're doing is they're simply diminishing kind of the torah connections of joshua by by and and they do this in other ways too. They mm-hmm. they take um, the uh, uh, you know the the life of the prophet Elijah, uh, and they right. they insert it into Jesus Christ's uh, ministry. They mm-hmm. they have uh, the miracle of uh, of uh, the multiplication of fish and bread. Well, this this is basically an expansion of Elijah. It's it's a way of showing that Jesus is connected to Elijah, but he is greater than he makes he makes. More right. fish, and more bread. Exactly right, and, right. And so with Joshua, it's it's basically the same thing. It's just very subtle mind control, really. It's it's if you think about it, what they're doing is they're trying to diminish the power of the of the prophets that are described in the Torah, their connection to God. They're trying to basically suddenly re subtly reshape them mm-hmm. in such a way that the reader can say, you know, perhaps the military path of uh, you know, that is given in the Torah, the whole lump of it is something that is, uh, you know, we can look uh, at in a, in a new way toward a new covenant. And so Joshua is actually, I, I would my, I would say the analysis is correct. And the purpose is simply to take all of the prophets to take, I mean, because, you know, bear in mind in, in the in the Gospels, you have almost all of the Hebrew prophets mentioned one way or another, or their literature is used. In sure, some right. Form. Mm-hmm. And, but you see, in, in the Gospels, the, the historical character and the prophets all somehow end up being something that is, um, in, in a way, diminished and, and also uh, being able to, uh, you know, the, the philosophy that they develop, the religious theology, um, can actually function inside of the Roman Empire. Yeah. So the 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 you know the approach you take I think is very radical to Joshua scholarship. I'm not aware of anyone else who's come up with this idea, but I think you're absolutely right. And I would think that you could just take the Gospels and then uh, you know c- categorize as in a list all of the individuals from the the Torah that are are being linked to or typologically right. used or quoted right. often mm-hmm. and then and then have a piece of analysis attached to each one and say this is how they're being diminished this is how they're being transmogrified this sure. is how they're being 
put into this new way of uh, of looking at um, uh, the uh, historical literature of the Jews, because you know the Gospels are are really the greatest overriding of uh, of a piece of literature in history. I mean, they they took the the Jewish uh, you know kind of scripture mm-hmm. and formed it into a kind of a cartoon because there's so much, in fact, absurdity and historical impossibility and and mockery of of Jewish people. Um, sure. And and so, you know, the um, uh, looking at the the history that the Torah contains and then comparing it to how it ends up being described in uh, in, in history and the individuals that, that are being described in, in the Torah and then comparing that to what goes on in the Gospels. And what you really see is the Roman hand. Right, um, sure. I, I had read, one of the books I, I, I had read before I started my analysis that ended up with Caesar the Messiah was Eisenman's book, James, the Brother of Jesus. Yep. And he he didn't um, connect into the typology. He actually did in a couple places. He, he saw parallels that if he had kind of expanded on them and looked at how they fit into the sequence of the different, you know, of you know, the ministry of uh, Jesus and the you know, the war history of, of uh, that Josephus wrote, he mm-hmm. probably would have come up with Caesar Messiah before I did, but sure. he didn't go. He didn't go into a broad sort of analysis of, uh, of what it could all mean, but he saw these links and the thing that he he repeated over and over again, and what he what he really deserves praise for is is exposing the Roman hand that how. The, the most coherent way to look at the literature of the Gospels or the Gospels as literature is is that there is a Roman hand in back of it. Mm-hmm. It doesn't appear to be a kind of a genuine uh, messianic Jewish you know philosophy. It seems more like just Roman propaganda. Sure. And uh, so that was, I thought, um, you know, very useful. I thought, though, this this actually makes more sense because I really got into um, you know, kind of this this stream of analysis, because I was very interested in the Dead Sea Scrolls, and I could make no sense out of the fact that here in the same era you had a Messianic movement that actually used the same proof texts um, that sure. uh, the the Messianic mm-hmm. movement that Jesus Christ purportedly belonged to. They they exist in the same location, and this is a tiny area. You're talking only a few hundred miles. Mm-hmm. How could they have not interacted or had opinions about one another or fact had conflict, but nowhere is in the Gospels is that original Messianic movement mentioned. And right. this, this seemed absolutely incoherent to me. I go, no, they have to, they have to, if, if Christianity as uh, the New Testament describes it did exist, there, there would have been interaction and there would have been descriptions of this and the, and the conflict between the two, because one is militaristic and hating Rome and wants to rebel, and in fact, part of the rebellion, and the other is opposed to any kind of rebellion against Rome, there would have been, in fact, it would have been the major subject of an honest uh, history of a of a, uh, a Messianic movement that was pacifistic. I mean, Steve, you can actually imagine a pacifistic, uh, you know, uh, Jewish religion in this era. I mean, it's possible to, to conceive it, but mm-hmm. but not one that wouldn't have had uh, in, in its scripture, in its perspective, historical perspective, a reaction against the other one. I think there's right, nothing that right. shows more that the Gospels were, uh, you know, just a top down conspiracy, to use an expression. Yeah. Um, yeah. Then then just the fact this just the absence of any kind of, uh, um, you know, uh, awareness uh, uh, and disclosure about the other Messianic movement in Judea at this time. And yeah, what's interesting, and I actually did a video recently um, on the Christian origins linking the Essenes and the Herods to this whole thing. And what I what I find very interesting, because you're bringing up the Messianic movement, the Qumran community, which most people would regard as the Essenes, something so interesting is that the Essenes never are named in the Gospels. and um, well, I guess if you're the ones writing, you wouldn't need to name yourselves. And that might not be like a, you know, shatterproof way of putting things, but if they had a hand in creating the theology or, 
or being the ones that are kind of wanting to be swept under the rug like they don't exist because the Gospels are being made to really discredit that movement. Um, yeah, I guess the, there's a there's a lot there's a lot to um, there's a lot to be told by the fact that they never show up by right. name as and, Josephus and would name them. You know, Josephus names them, and he mentions that they are militaristic, or they that a member of the Essenes is part of the rebellion against Rome. So they weren't as pacifistic as, you know, some people have have made them out to be. And I think when Josephus mentions three great religious movements of the Jews, and one of them is the Essene, and he describes them as kind of hermits, and you can get the impression mm -hmm. that they're, you know, somewhat anti-war because they're remote, uh, you know, living in camps in the wilderness and whatnot. Um, yeah, uh, but, but guerrilla guerrilla camp warfare is how the Jews were rebelling against the Romans even up until Bar Kokhba, right? So yeah, for sure, for sure. So and and and, and then he contradicts that image. I think the 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 image of the Essene, the understanding, because there's almost no literature about them. You're talking about a few hundred lines of, of text, you know. So mm -hmm. there's really no documentation of them. We just have Josephus's description of them. And I think some another writer wrote about them or used the term, but I don't know. That that person may have just been borrowing it from Josephus. But the fact is, is that the Essenes are um, kind of a historical stick figure. We don't really know yeah. much about them. Um, right. And so people are able to basically fantasize about them without any concern about being falsified because yeah. there's, enough, yeah, sure. there's not enough facts to falsify any kind of conjecture concerning them. So you end up with the Essenes being the original Christians or, you know, there's just, there's a whole, whole books of literature concerning the, what the Essenes were. It was kind of this proto Christianity and, you know, this, I mean, I hate to say it, but it's just complete rubbish. There, there just isn't <laughs> enough data concerning them to come up right, with these, right. to really defend these conjectures. Um, what we have, which is, which leads to, I think, a lot more coherent analysis is the Dead Sea Scrolls. I mean, if we look at, just look at the material, uh -huh. you look how militaristic it is. Yep. And you look how, um, uh, you know, just fundamental it is in terms of its religious uh, habits, you know, and, and rituals. Um, this is really uh, a coherent messianic movement coming mm -hmm. from Judea in an, in, in an era where Rome occupied the region. I mean, this yeah. is, you can really understand the, the literature of the, of the Dead Sea Scrolls as linking directly to the rebellion. You mm -hmm. know, the, because they were found, you know, hidden in pots and it isn't a, a coherently organized, uh, you know, anthology of the group's religion. It just appears to be some, some texts that I would imagine they wanted to protect from Rome's destruction of them, right? So they were right. they were hidden um, and then rediscovered. But you know, and of course, there you know, so many of them are damaged. You can't really read all of the the text. It's it, you you have to kind of just use conjecture with with with, with the or, with the whole package of the scrolls, but. You can see in general that this is the, uh, the this is the literature of the rebellious messianic movement. This literature would have connected perfectly into the rebels that Josephus described, the religious rebels, right? Sure. It's fanatical. It's uh, it's very xenophobic. It hates uh, Rome. It's mm -hmm. ready to to fight. So yeah. when they were written. Um, you know, who who the characters were in terms of linking into history. I mean, Eisman, I think, blunders, uh, sad to say, and he tries to link. Well, he doesn't actually claim out and declare it, but he he suggests that some of the characters in in the uh, in the scrolls could have been uh, historically represented in the Gospels, particularly Paul. He suggests hmm. this is a possibility. Um, Interesting. I, I don't think this is correct. I think that Paul is a fictional character, just like Jesus. Um, but uh, th this this is the analysis that uh, Eisenman did uh, is is really good, really important and useful. People should should read through it because it shows how Paul can be seen as a Roman agent. And this is, I think, the right way to to start right. the analysis of the you know the Pauline material is it is linked to to Rome. We don't know for sure if Paul is a historical character. I would you know strongly suggest he's not. But nevertheless, what is real, what is foundational, what 
you can use as an analytic platform is the fact there's a Roman hand that yeah. this literature, that what Paul is, whoever is producing this literature can be seen as being aligned with Roman political interests. Mm -hmm. and, and so now you have, I think, you know, a kind of a platform from which you can move forward and try to decode the Pauline material. Um, right. But um, uh, Paul, you know, uh, is again, going back to your, ana your, your analogy about Joshua, and, and it's very, your, your, what you suggested is very important in terms of looking at how they develop Paul, because Paul starts mm -hmm. out as a rebe rebel, right? He is, mm -hmm. he is fighting against, uh, you know, kind of the, the, some, and again, there, there's no, there's no real description as to exactly who these groups are, but you get the idea that Paul has, you know, he's a rebel, he's fighting, he's battling. Then he has an epiphany. And yeah. then the scales are moved from his eyes. And now he <laughs> becomes, you know, aligned with the Roman Christ. So if you, if you look at that structure, you can say, well, it looks like he was fighting against Rome. And then at the end of the epiphany, he was actually promoting Rome. Mm, now, interesting. This is the trajectory I suggest people should look at how the historical, uh, uh, you know, um, facts and, and, and individuals uh, in the Old Testament are transmogrified by the Roman hand in the Gospels. Right. It just happens everywhere. It happens over and over and over again. You start out with kind of the xenophobic, militaristic, fundamental Judaism. It goes through the blender and out pops someone who's telling you to, to obey the magistrates. Yeah, exactly. Paul. So, mm -hmm. so this is this this. Uh, so, what the the epiphany of Paul is really an important uh, kind of an intellectual structure for people to look at and to apply to the whole literature. Because of, I, I just think it all it always is the same thing. You you start out with xenophobia and you know kind of uh, you know uh, like a fundamental Judaism, and then the Roman blender occurs, and out the out the other mm -hmm. side pops. Jesus Christ, Paul, and 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 a, and a way of looking at the uh, the Hebrew prophets as though they were somehow linking into this Romanized you know form of Judaism that we call Christianity. Right, right, yeah. And in that same vein, we're going to get to Paul in a little bit, but there's just a few a few um, things I'd like to touch on in the Gospels themselves that not only don't seem historical, but really just paint the opposite picture of what you would expect from something that's there to fulfill the prophecies found in the Hebrew Bible, right? So just to name a few, you see Pilate sees no charge for Jesus, where historically Josephus says Pilate was not so nice of a guy, right? Herod Antipas also finds no fault in him, despite a messianic claim, but yet elsewhere in the Gospels, the Herods were seeking actively seeking Jesus to kill him, right? Right. Pilate's yeah. Pilate's wife has a prophetic dream about Jesus. So a Roman woman is having prophecies that Jesus is the Christ. John 19 claims that the Romans fulfill Zechariah 12 when they pierce his side. And the centurion and his slave are the ones with the greatest faith in Israel. So over and over, especially as you get into John and so on, the the Jews are portrayed as liars, they have scales over their eyes, they are sons of the devil, so on and so forth. But on the converse, the Romans are the ones who get it. You know, So mentioning that Roman hand you said, it's really showing them as the protagonists and the Jews to be the antagonists. How do you feel about that? Well, I think you're completely clear-minded. I mean, what what is amazing is that it's taken two thousand years for your position to even be considered by scholarship, because it is so uh, coherent. I mean, I mean, when you when you present them that way, and it's that you know, well done. That's a nice collection. I, I kind of, I've never seen that exact collection presented. That's a good one. Um, <laughs> when you see that collection, right, you have to go. You have to scratch your head and you go, well. This doesn't seem like legitimate historical religious literature. This this looks a little bit like propaganda, right? Right. So so this is the thing is that, uh, you know, the character of Jesus became the most historical character that we had. I mean, during the Middle Ages, you know, when Christianity was the state religion, right? It was sure. It, it was he he was his his historicity 
was a 100 percent you know it was like greater, <laughs> yeah. greater even than you know your your magistrate this was this was real history um and and over the you know centuries it just became um uh, you know just inculcated to, to an extreme where no one would would start thinking about the literature of the gospels in any other way of recording something that's real um and because of that just the the kind of the normal uh, way of looking at the literature with a little bit of skepticism with with i would say you know with a with an active mind uh, right. as as you must have had to to produce your collection uh it was lost right just no one was doing it and so right then scholars, well i think the i think the church also had a hand in making sure people didn't do that oh exactly yeah they, that was part of how the mind can yeah, of course you know they they would uh, well you'd, you'd be killed if you tried to um, <laughs> yeah yeah you know. sure so so it was, it was very you know there was but but anyway, so people just so that when when New Testament critical scholarship started to come about, you know, in like the 19th century, it was um, it was difficult for it to make any legitimate progress because it was trying to figure out the actual history um, that the, the literature represented. Um, it didn't take as a position. Well, what if none of its history? You know, how, how do we know its history? You know, how, how, do, wh how do we how do we deal with all of these? Uh, Romanized passages, right? Um, so rather than taking that kind of clear-minded step, it, it, it wasn't really prepared to do do so at that point, right? It, yeah. So you had this this long period of New Testament scholarship where they they just kind of fiddled with it, you know, and and uh, they they started to, you know, they would come up with fantasies like, well, Luke had a congregation like this, and Mark was writing to these people. I mean, they were just living in a, like this cloud cuckoo land, you know, of of conjecture, uh, yeah. just based on the premise of historicity, right? So this is this is really what what happened. Then, um, you know, I kind of there were others, but Bruno Bauer started to, uh, you know, he he started saying, well, the whole idea of Jesus may just be a religious myth, um, and from there, you know, you started having you know, more kind of real analysis of the Gospels of sure. just taking it as as literature, trying to place it in, in history, trying to place it in the context of its moment when mm -hmm. it's purported to be written, trying to place the character Jesus as, you know, into what we know of, of the history of, of that era. Um, and none of it seemed to fit. It all just seemed to, once you start to do just ordinary analysis of, you know, that if if the gospels were just found like five years ago, it, they would have been uncovered as uh, Roman propaganda within like a month. Yeah. You know? But because of the weight of the right, you know, right. profound historicity, it just took this long to get to, um, you know, kind of people like myself who are doing, you know, really extreme kinds of analysis. You know, where mm -hmm. we we don't buy anything. We we just want to try to make the most sense out of we can. Right. Um, I, I would say that the the failure of New Testament scholarship uh, to miss the um, the fact that the ministry of Jesus follows a kind of sequential parallel to the uh, war that uh, Josephus recorded, right? The the Battle of yeah, Titus. Right. To fail to see this is the greatest oversight in human intellectual history. Yep. I mean, think about this. The, the, there are historical events in the Gospels, again, that nobody questions, right? I mean, that you have like uh, the, the encircling of Jerusalem, the raising of the temple, the, mm -hmm. the abomination of desolation, right, that Jesus predicted and Josephus recorded. Um, so you've got these three events, right, that are, that are just obviously from the war. But the fact is, what makes them so vivid to to the reader is that they occur in the same sequence in the Gospels as they do, right. uh, you know, in the war. So that simple fact, this historical fact, this 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 piece of reality that we can glom onto as we begin to under, try to understand the Gospels, um, is that that sequence is meaningful, right? It, there there it does right. have a meaning just in in that those little three three events I mentioned. Well. Okay, then when you kind of you know scope out from that and look at the overall ministry of Jesus, it just becomes mm -hmm. absolutely transparent that you know that it is based on the the military campaign Josephus mm -hmm. was describing. 
Of course. Um, and, of course. And, and so you can see that, you know, my, you know, like, like people are, are sometimes, you know, I get different kinds of criticism. A lot of it's just, you know, uh, hateful, um, you know, God bless these people, but they, sure. they, dis they dislike it. And, um, you know, <laughs> I'm, would attack. I'm, I'm, I can relate. So <laughs> yeah, they attack my character or whatever. It, this is yep. fine. This is like a normal reaction, particularly people who are coming from a, uh, you know, position of faith. Um, right. But the fact is, is that the only thing I really did was just see the sequence. Once you have, sure, the sequence, of course, you can start to plug the events that are either historical or literally the same thing, like a a trip from Galilee to Jerusalem, for example. Mm -hmm. But in other words, there's no there's no you know kind of exotic analysis of it that's required to see the parallel. It's just the same right. thing. And mm -hmm. anyway, once you do that, then uh, Jesus's ministry basically becomes obviously dependent upon, you know, it was, it was built out of, of the war. Jesus is therefore a forerunner. He's, he's, uh, he's foreshadowing what's going to happen uh, in 40 years. Mm -hmm. And then frankly, the whole thing just falls apart in the character of Jesus. You can completely disassemble him because once you start, I yep. mean, he's always, he's always, as I'm sure, you know, he's always been seen as typologically constructed to some extent you know there's a like old course. testament typology of course. Inside mm -hmm. character. I, did a, I did a whole video called copycat jesus where i just yeah. laid out the yeah the um parallels with moses yeah. and elijah yeah and then, and then what's you... what's incredible is the they they told on themselves because the culmination is the mount of transfiguration where those two appear so it's like you told on yourself giving it your stamp of approval you know right Right, and of course it's like theologically ludicrous, but okay, th this is what how the story is. Um, but the fact is, is that um, the character of Jesus, the historicity after kind of the first phase of New Testament critical scholarship took place, um, was that well, there's a lot of fiction here, but there is this kernel of historicity. We can, you know, like right. the, that we we you know, this is what was real, and then they embellished it with some some typology. But the problem is this is only possible if you don't take into consideration the uh, the typology that looks forward to Titus's campaign. When, mm -hmm. Once you plug that into the character of Jesus, you can see he was he was just he, the character disappears. People always ask me, you know, you know, is this was there a historical Jesus? And I mean, it's it's kind of the wrong question. The the, the real question is, right. is is does the character in the gospel have any basis in historical reality? I mean, right. That, that that's a different question, and I think it's the right one. And the fact is that question can be answered no, because this character, the character in the Gospels, is a typological character. Right. His, his pre-ministry was constructed out of Moses, and his ministry was constructed out of the wars between the Romans and the Jews. Sure. And I think that's, to bring this full circle to the very first topic, I think that's where you see that you really have Titus as the Roman Joshua. Right. And therefore you get yeah. you get that Jesus name. And I think that kind of brings it full circle as to what you what you were just saying. You know yeah. how it's it's yeah, typology yeah. from everywhere. You know, yeah. I've I've even had um, Dr. Dennis McDonald on to talk about his mimesis theory and. Uh, the Homeric epics being potential layouts for the gospel narratives and so on. And the thing with me is I don't necessarily subscribe to any one theory. Right. What I try to do is look at them all together, especially when we see how sophisticated the Greek is and how sophisticated the storytelling is. Right, I think right. when you bring all that together, it makes much more sense. Like when you yeah. see that a highly educated Roman official or a group of Roman officials who would have been educated in the classics as their contemporary education, now it's all starting to come together. Of course. I mean, the Donald stuff I think is very coherent. I, I can't verified but it, i don't have any means of falsifying it seems very clear to me um and it's it's natural to you know assume that there would have been a thought world that the roman authors of sure. the gospels were produced with and right so that when you start seeing like kind of like some uh greek mythology inside of of the gospels you're just looking at the thought world of the authors. It's, exactly. It's, it's, mm -hmm. uh, it, you know, it, it just helps actually 
um, support and, and clarify the yep. understanding of who wrote yep. the thing, you know, and who mm -hmm. they were and what they were like, because um, we're not going to get any of that from reading, you know, Josephus or Suetonius or any of the Roman historians. And we're certainly not going to get it by reading the Gospels. You have to kind of, unfortunately, um, you know, use conjecture and logic to be able mm -hmm. to try to understand, you know, who the authors were and what they were like. And so looking at the, the Gospels from the you know, perspective of, well, Greek mythology, you, you just start to see into, into the, what I, I'm sure was the thought world of the, of the people who wrote the material. Right, exactly. Especially when you have, and we can move on to the next topic after this point, but when you have like in Luke's Gospel, he's claiming, you know, I got the best information, right? I went to all the yeah. sources. I have the best information. Yet in Acts, he can't even get the tomb of the patriarchs location right, you know, and that's something right. that that's something that a seven year old Jewish boy in Beit Shemesh would know like that. Of course, you know, but, and, and but you have the best information. So it's clear that the the dissemination, the people that might have been receiving this literature didn't really have that understanding either and weren't familiar with the topics at hand. Right. They they um, present themselves to the, the reader as having the best information as part of creating authority. Um, so the reader will take their material seriously and believe in it. Josephus makes the same claim, mm -hmm. um, you know, that he has uh, this expertise in history and he he was given the best information concerning the war by uh, by Titus. So, you know, you, you just have to accept him as the, the authority and whatever mm -hmm. this individual tells you is correct. And Luke. Yeah, I mean, I mean, Josephus, that. Josephus, I mean, sorry to cut you off, but Josephus, no. just to echo that point. Uh, in his own like um, resume building, he would say, oh, that all of the greatest of the, the, the Pharisees and Sadducees and so on, they would ask me questions. I was the smartest Jew out there, you know? Yeah. And that's just mind control. It's just a way to establish the, mm -hmm. the author as beyond um, criticism. He's an authority of, to, to the extent that he's, he's impossible to, to criticize. You're literally, you know, getting the, the closest proximity to truth any other than from directly from God as imagined. Right. So so this is just mind control. It's this is this is what a, an author who's going to basically sell you a bill of goods, a pack of lies, mm -hmm. um, needs to do in order to keep your uh, uh, you know kind of the intuition and skepticism that the human mind normally has when it's being presented new material from working, from being activated. And right. it was it worked brilliantly, and it, and it still works today. I mean, our our president sure. <laughs> works uses the exact same device. Um, you know, I mean, I, I won't go into the you know my particular political foibles, but I will just say like look at like the vaccine mandates. You know, you you get uh, people who who are set up as just impossible to criticize. You know, they have right. PhDs and smocks and things. But then when you start to get into it to pick it apart you can see well there's a lot here that's exactly going on. we're not being told there's a lot here we can be skeptical about and right and i would just say in general um that the the most valuable thing about about my book or the books that i've written is that they promote skepticism you know, sure 100 yeah, yeah the 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 public needs that because the oligarchs have uh, developed uh, some very sophisticated technology for mind control they you mm -hmm. know they don't need uh, you know, preachers spouting the gospel, they have, you know, Facebook and Google and all this stuff to, right, to right. really control us. And so in order to keep democracy viable, the public needs to push back and develop its its own, uh, you know, mm -hmm. like more sophisticated skills. And it starts with just healthy skepticism. Yep, 100 percent. So to transition into the next topic, you had mentioned that you don't really see Paul as a historical figure. No. I personally, I I would say I do, and that's just something we can disagree upon, but we can still come together and find some synthesis in how we approach his texts, though. Um, well, yeah. I'm actually working on a book called Paul, the Undercover Antiochus, ah, uh, cool. and, uh, <laughs> and uh, I just wanted to tease out, in Acts 28, um, it claims that just like Jesus, the Romans found no fault in Paul. Yeah. Right. Only the Jews did. And we even see that in Pauline literature that he's basically like a pseudo Christ. Right. He completes the suffering of Jesus. He's he's poured out as wine for the others. If he's poured out as a sin sacrifice. Right. Um, you know, his own sufferings are completing the work. And. 
to continue on from that, it's it's only the Jews that are really wanting his arrest and so on and so forth. But what's funny is when you find him in Acts 28, near the end of the chapter, he basically is given his own apartment with armed guards, right? And it says that he can still preach his gospel without hindrance, right? And this character, Paul, if it's a conglomerate of people, if it was a historical figure, um, that doesn't change the fact that we have Romans 13. And if Romans 13 is, in essence, Paul's gospel, why would the Romans arrest him for that, right? So he gets handed yeah. into the hands of the Romans. They kind of give him armed guard. I mean, we even see in older manuscripts or manuscripts that still have, um, you know, his salutations to whom he's writing to. He's basically like addressing Caesar on a first name basis, right? Um, greeting yeah. people in Caesar's household. I mean, how does this guy, if he's just a lonely Jew in Judea who had a religious experience on the way to Damascus to kill Christians, how is he rubbing elbows with the most powerful man in the empire? How could he even use a mail system? I mean, sending letters uh, to you know overseas was like only done by uh, the imperial court and the great trading companies. I mean, mm -hmm. individual citizens couldn't do this because it was too expensive. So, well, I mean, I that mean, would also explain why the churches he's founding are in some of your biggest, like Ephesus, for example. It's some of your largest cultural and economic hubs in the region. Yeah, I mean, the, the interesting thing to me about the, you know, the cities in Revelation is that they were all centers of the imperial cult. Sure. And I think that that's, you know, deliberate. I think that um, those would have been the sort of uh, original places where the Gospels would have been preached. I mean, and they would have simply, you know, told the uh, the priests that they had under their Rome's, you know, on the payroll and said, look, preach this this version of Judaism. Right. Right. Because this there, there's rebellion, it's it's leaking out into the entire empire, and we've got to try to get control over it. So we've got a different approach here. Um, we want you to preach uh, a pacifistic pro-Roman messianic version of Judaism. So sure. whether or not it was the Gospels themselves or just some proclamation or if they had, you know, I don't know, who, who knows what kind of, you know, props they had to, like, get this idea across. But I suspect that's that's what Paul's letter are, are linking into is uh, that there there would have been communities or you know, agents of the new Roman Judaism that would have been coming out of the imperial uh, city, imperial court, mm -hmm. imperial cult cities, and that's why the letters are addressed to those those specific cities, and yeah. and they, you have all of these Roman names listed. It it could have been actually um, a kind of uh, you know, historical representation of the first Christian preachers. That that could be what's sure. being reflected in, mm -hmm. in Paul's in Paul's letters. Um, as to when they were written and to, you know, the extent of Paul being his, historical, I would just point out, I, I I think that you you start in my mind with the idea that the gospels and the character of Jesus were written following the war. Right. I mean, so this is, I think, something everyone can agree upon, you know. Yeah. So now, therefore, there was no Christianity for Paul to have been interacting with in the 50s. Right. The only Christianity that could have, have been in, in that time is would have been the rebellious form. Mm -hmm. Or perhaps you, you could have had uh, like a Herodian version of Christianity that was attempting what what Roman Christianity attempted to to, uh, uh, you know, basically tone down uh, Jewish messianism uh, in the 50s. That is possible. And there could have sure. been, you know, an agent who was trying to organize it. They could have even, been, they could have called him Paul. Yeah. You know, so, yeah. so this would have been, um, you know, but it wouldn't have been the Paul that we, you know, read about in, uh, in the gospel. Right, that, right. That I'm sure he was mythologized just as much. Yeah, sure. that, that individual is, if you look at the timing of it, that individual is, you know, clearly, you know, thinking that uh, Jesus has had an effect on the world. So right. you have to place him, even though, you know, there's some, you know, you can kind of tease out semantical understandings that are, you know, distinct and different, you know. But th this individual, Paul, that we get in, 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 the, uh, in the New Testament, he's linking to the, um, 
to the to the character in the Gospels. He has some relationship to the phenomena of Jesus that occurred before him. Mm-hmm. And and the word Passover, his use of the metaphor of Passover really helps clarify this because Paul uses the concept in the same way as it appears in the Gospels that Jesus is symbolically becoming the new Passover lamb. Okay, so he, he you know, he, he refers to him as our Passover. Yep. Um, mm-hmm. Now, the Passover is the, uh, the human Passover lamb is the central concept in, in the Gospels. It's all set up to establish the new covenant and Jesus is the Passover lamb of the new covenant. You know, this is the, this is the theological foundation of, of the Gospels and of Christianity. But right. They were developed, obviously, after the war because they, they linked the death of Jesus in Passover 33 to the end of the Roman War, exactly 40 years to the day, mm, you know, mm-hmm. on Passover 73 with the fall of Masada. So they've mirrored the, um, you know, the, the, uh, the, the first covenant's establishment with the 40 years of wandering. Right. You know, okay, so they, they create this mirror of when the first Passover lamb occurred, when Moses was able to go into the prom, or he didn't get to go, but when, when the Israelites could go into uh, Israel. Um, so they have, with Jesus, they've established this 40-year cycle from Passover 33 to Passover 73 with the fall of Messiah. Right, right. But this is obviously done after the fact. You could only create that cycle you know, after Masada has fallen, because that's right. the only way you can back calculate. Exactly. It. How else could you know? Yeah. Right. How else would you know? So, so this means that the 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 Roman Christianity was established post Masada, but then and and the the Passover concept specifically could only have been established post Masada mm. because you couldn't have established the forty year cycle for the Passover lamb until after you know it it you'd have the war conclude. So that means that Paul's use of the term indicates that his literature's follow is was created after uh, the fall of Masada. Mm-hmm. So, so and well, the 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 Joannine literature echoes the same thing. Yeah. You know, so I think that's how we can tease out that the Joannine tradition is the latest of the Gospels. I'd assume. You yeah. know, be- yeah. because I mean, they're I, making that same assertion. Well, well, what I in uh, in Shakespeare's Secret Messiah, which is a strangely named book to have put this analysis in, but I did. Um, there, I show that um, you you just uh, have a development of of the Gospels into well the the Synoptics into jo- the Gospel of John, and then on into Revelation and, and Paul. Mm-hmm. And what you're actually looking at with that transformation is the different control controllers of the literature specifically right. Domitian after the gospels had been written um, by his brother produced by Titus which I think is clear because he's the the star of the show so to speak if you look at the typology it's all developed to show that mm, the son of man uh, uh, who destroys the temple is the Jewish Messiah, and therefore it is Titus Slavy. So in other words, it's a, the Synoptic Gospels are Titus's vanity piece. Hmm. So following this, Domitian takes over the literature after Titus's death, and now he produces his own Jesus, who is Paul, basically. This Paul links into sure, okay. uh, Reve- Revelation. The, and in the Revelation, pseudo-Christ, yeah. Yeah, yeah and so I, I show that the Lord God of Revelation is a um, is a spoof of Domitian, um, which is uh, you'd have to read the the uh, the analysis to see how how bizarre the typology is because in the Gospels you have a very kind of neat and precise typology. There's some humor and and some absurdism and some mockery of Jewish uh, you know kind of foreshadowing typology, but Overall, it's very tidy and neat. Once you get into the sequence, you can you can make predictions. In fact, you know, I I knew where to look for the uh, parallel to the crucifixion scene mm-hmm. uh, because I I knew that it was going to be located in a in the sequence, and so I you know there was only a few hundred words that I had to kind of parse through to figure out where it was, and there it was, it was sitting staring at me. So it has a predictive value because it's within the sequence, but. 
Domitian wrote his typology <clears throat> knowing that whoever gets as far as, uh, you know, the book of Revelation or letters of Paul has already gone through and understood uh, Titus's typology. So hmm. it, is, it is therefore, of, of, it's far more complicated and uh, less precise. It's more um, uh, kind of absurd. Um, I mean, like some of the, the typological linkage, I mean, I'll just give you one of them is uh, in, uh, you know, they describe in Revelation that uh, the God has feet of bronze, right? Well, if you read my analysis, I show that this is one of the characteristics of, of Domitian that is being spoofed. And this is because he had what was called hammer toes. Hmm. Interesting. So, but you see, so this is this is not something that, I mean, it, it wouldn't be a, a, a typological linkage that's in a classic religious you know, format. It isn't right. It isn't really something that you can, as a single typologic element, make any sense out of or even believe it's real. You have to see it as part of a collection. When when mm -hmm. you have the collection of the of the linkages between, you know, um, Domitian and the Lord God of Revelation, then you can start to start to see it. But you would never do this until you've you've actually gone through the um, the kind of decoding the Titus typology, mm -hmm. and that really makes Paul and uh, and Revelation so difficult for people to understand. In fact, one way to really you know if you want to like ridicule or negate you know, my analysis, you can just take a single aspect of the linkage between, um, you know, uh, Sue Antonius's description of Domitian mm -hmm. and, uh, and Revelation and say, Lucian, look at this, this is insane. I mean, how could anyone ever think that these things are parallel? You have to be reading this material with the bias established by having decoded the Gospels and sure. knowing that the literature is being set up as typologic literature as a vanity piece for the Roman Caesars. Once you have that mm -hmm. bias, your mind is in a you know perspective that you can make sense out of some <laughs> of the stuff. But I mean, it's right. the the um, uh, you know they uh, if you if you just uh, there are some historical parallels that between the Lord God of Revelation. I mean, first of all, as a title, they were both referred the, the Lord God of Revelation and the mission were both referred to as a living God. That was one of their. Yeah. Uh, um, they they had a church in Ephesus. You know, this was uh, that was first in the order of importance. Um, Ephesus is the first church mentioned, and it's also the um, uh, the the uh, the city that had the, uh, uh, the the headquarters of the cult of Domitian. So this yeah. is okay. You can start to interesting. You start, yeah, you can start to to you know break apart the uh, um, the. Just the way that they, uh, the thought world that these people lived in. I mean, Revelation is a mockery. It is a laugh riot. It, it is done, I think, to make the Caesar Domitian laugh, basically. Hmm. And that's kind of what it was created to do. And um, therefore, you have to have this perspective, which is completely different. Oh, than sure. That of a, of sure. A historical or Because, I mean, that's. That's yeah. so far removed from like even just, just how I approach the book, you know? Yeah, of course. You know, so so this is, uh, you know, I if if uh, I put this in uh, my book, Shakespeare's um, Secret Messiah. And, and why did I do that? Well, because I decode Shakespeare and I show that a lot of the material, the Shakespearean material is based upon the Roman typology in the New Testament. Interesting. Whoever was producing Shakespeare, they, they, this group had decoded it. They had figured it out, and they then mocked it with their literature. So hmm. Shakespeare, the Shakespearean literature is as uh, basically as as, as uh, you know as as a uh, uh, cryptic uh, as yeah. as the Gospels yeah. are. You, you don't, well, no one people merchant, don't understand. Yeah. merchant of Venice doesn't have a very high regard for Jews either. So <laughs> no, but the thing is, actually, it, it does. You just have to kind of know the you know the the kind of how the typology works, but. The, the, Interesting. The, the, the play that I would suggest, uh, and I start out my analysis with, because it's so easy to understand, is Titus Andronicus. Okay. Because Titus Andronicus is simply, uh, it kind of retells the story of Titus's foundation of, of Christianity, but it does it in a way to mock Titus. You end hmm. up with the Last Supper where Titus is getting um, 
the the Gentile nobility to eat human flesh. So it's reversing uh, wow. the humor in the Gospels. And interesting. And, and uh, as I point out, you know, the fact that the play is a uh, uh, you know is a symbolic representation of the Flavians is really not to be disputed. Um, I point out like things like uh, at one point in the play Titus Andronicus. Uh, Someone comes up to the character Titus and he says, you know, what he has a brother. He goes, what is your uh, what is your brother doing? And Titus says, well, he's all by himself and he's killing flies. And they, they go on for like several passages. They go, why is your brother killing flies? It doesn't become the brother of Titus for just to sit there and killing flies. Well, if you know uh, Sue Antonius, you know that one of that, that Dominic, Domitian's um, most fun habit was to be by himself and kill flies. So, wow. so it's it's, it's Very an interesting. absolute it's an absolute uh, dead on revelation that this is some kind of a disclosure concerning the Flavians, and then you have in the play you actually have um, uh, Aaron, who is uh, you know this would have been the family that Josephus claimed you know to be descended from. He actually takes uh, someone down from the cross, you know, just as Joseph of Arimathea does, and then the wow. child survives. You know, so. You, you have really direct, kind of obvious typological linkage into the story of the Gospels that that I that I show in, in Caesar's Messiah. So I put the analysis of of Paul and Revelation in there because it adds cool. to it and clarifies some of the stuff they that they talk about in in Shakespeare. But wow. the whole thing is, um, I mean, I I hadn't looked at the book. Because I know you were going to talk about it, so I said, "Gee, I should probably glance through that book because I've forgotten half of the stuff I read." <laughs> it's, and I realize, you know, it's just so complicated, so difficult to get through. You really have to have a kind of zealotry to make sense of this complicated typology. Um, yeah, yeah. And and you and, have to have and you have to have read Caesar's Messiah and really understood that kind of typological stuff. And then, right? Then you know you can a lot of the Shakespeare stuff is. Is so, is so straightforward that once I show it, you know, like the empty tomb scene in Romeo and Juliet, once you understand that all of the, um, the metaphors about cannibalism are basically mocking what occurs in the gospel. The Eucharist, the yeah, supper, sure. Yeah. Um, then you can understand, well, why is the whole play Romeo and Juliet based around the Feast of Lamastad? What, what is that for? I mean, and right. they have all, okay, well, it's because Lamastad is the Gentile equivalent of the Passover. It's the feast of the consecrated bread. Yeah. So, so yep. you're, you're, you're basically creating the bread for Lamastad with the mm -hmm. empty tomb scene with the dead bodies and stuff. And you're, you're basically making a cry, a, a, a wry comment on, you know, people are going to be eating human flesh just as right. And and look at the look at the amping up in the Gospel of John of the Eucharist itself. He's exactly. Jesus is teaching it in a synagogue, saying, "My flesh is true meat indeed, and only by eating it do you gain eternal life." That's nowhere in the synoptics. Hundred percent. And there you go. So you you see how they the 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 Gospels create a, a subtle connection, mm -hmm. which you can kind of understand if the, if you lay the sequence of these stories side by side and then do a little bit of ciphering because even then once you i mean some of the events are completely i mean like encircling jerusalem with a wall okay well you don't need to you know kind of conjure up some kind of analysis for that one it's just the same thing but when right. you get into like the eucharist then you have to look at well josephus at that point in the story has the this long weird story about cannibal mary who eats her son you right. see it's a, it's a physical cannibalization of an individual who's being established as a human, as a Passover lamb. Mm -hmm. So now you could now go back and see. That. And that, that itself actually, if, if Josephus made that up, that could actually be a draw or a, a, um, a callback to in the Torah itself, where it says, you know, if you don't obey my commandments, you know, these are the, these are the, the blessings and the curses, right? Yeah. It curses. It curses. It says, "I'm going to exile you to the point that you're going to eat your own children." It's going to get that bad, exactly. you know. So that I mean, that it, could exactly be Josephus's. Right. Josephus does, of course, have some type of Jewish worldview, at least a little bit, and would know these things from you well, know he, hearing he, them, he, hearing he them has, in shul every week, or yeah, or something to that effect. So he's a complete, complete understanding of 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 the Torah because he uses it over and over again in his writings. Right. So he, he's right. 
he is an expert in it. And when he created the, this famous passage of Cannibal Mary, there, there's been books written about the passage and they all, you know, noticed all of this deep Hebraic kind of symbolism that Josephus is like, you know, using to, to construct which is what is obviously a fictional passage. Yeah. I mean, for one thing, uh -huh. uh, no one was there to record any of the quotes that, that he that he <laughs> right. mentioned. So it's obviously mm -hmm. just, it's there for symbolic purpose. And again, it's it has the overt symbolic purpose of basically cursing the Jews or kind of hurling a curse on them and mm -hmm. with their with their literature, with their scriptures for their misbehavior and rebellion, uh, and they end up eating their, their children. But if you compare it typologically uh, it, within the sequence, you can see this is exactly the point where Jesus talks about, you know, eating my flesh and drinking my blood. And so what's being mm -hmm. presented there is that it's a real cannibalization, that there is actual human flesh being given to, uh, you know, the people at the Last Supper. It, that idea is, is not recorded it's something you have to uh, basically calculate typologically, but it is it is literally there because they they are linking that passage to a passage in Josephus wherein uh, human cannibalization occurs. So that you can't really Interesting. escape the, uh, the this this uh, conclusion. Sure. Yeah, and to kind of change gears, as I said, I kind of wanted to synthesize multiple views here. The way I approach Revelation, I did a whole show on this, is. I did a whole show called Unholy War, right? And it's I basically approach all the texts of the New Testament, not so much the Gospels, but more the epistles and so on as polemics. They're all polemics against something. Um, yeah. And especially the first few chapters of Revelation, where it's addressing all the churches in Asia Minor, they're all churches that, oh, that Paul, quote-unquote, founded. So I really see it as... And it could just as easily be as you said kind of like a spoof but if you read it in the more con in this more conservative light i guess um that it's more of a polemic of what i would consider more like a philo hellenized judaism alexandrian christianity tradition against this more roman western tradition if that makes sense um you kind of have like the joannine saying, you know what, Jesus is saying that everything Paul is teaching is wrong. <laughs> you get what I mean? And kind of using the letters in red for a modern example to um, really go against the, the Romans 13 idea that this whole antinomian do-whatever-you-want type thing, um, that's just where I stand on it personally. Uh, uh, it's a totally clear mind. I mean, I, I would point out that, you know, when you, when you talk about um, Philo as uh, kind of, sort of foundational to this idea. I mean, yeah, that, I really see Philo as almost the godfather of Christian theology. I mean, he's blending, oh, yeah. he's blending really the Greek mind and the Jewish mind and allegorizing the entire Tanakh. Right. So, so it's, it's useful then to, you know, look at him within the context the historical context we have of him and that um, Tiberius Alexander, who is the first person to stand for Vespasian seizing of the throne and mm -hmm. became the primary general of the Flavians in the siege of Jerusalem is the nephew of Philo. Wow. Interesting. And, and, and his, his father, the Albarch of Alexandria, who is uh, uh, Philo's brother, um, is recorded in Suetonius as having this like generational, the, the, the Alexanders have this general ge generational relationship with the Flavians. They were all mm. in, the, in the court of uh, Antonia, um, Nero's mother, and they, they you know, I mean, uh, Antonia's uh, secretary, uh, Canaeus, I think is her name, was the uh, mistress of Vespasian. So, so Philo, you know who is producing this? Oh, that's that's uh, Herod's granddaughter. Yeah. So so yeah. So Bernice. So, Bernice, right? Well, Bernice becomes Titus's girlfriend during the war. A different. different oh right. Person, okay. But, okay. But she was at she was at the court as well because the Herods and uh, um, the Alexanders were close, and so you can. And then of course she becomes Titus's girlfriend. So you can see, look, mm -hmm. the three families: the Alexanders, right, the Herods, right. and and the 
uh, the Flavians were thick as thieves. Um, they were controlling the money. The money mm-hmm. is really in back of all of this stuff. It's all the wars, the religions, everything. They're, they're, money is really the kind of the prime oh, of mover. Course. And, of course. And so the Messianic movement of Judea that rebelled had as its major sin the fact that it interrupted the flow of money to, to uh-huh. Roman imperial coffers. And so, um, the, and, and, Therefore, particularly to these to these families, the Alexanders and the Herods, the Alexanders mm-hmm. controlled. Uh, they were the tax farmers, as as best can be understood, of of uh, of the area around Egypt, and the Herods were controlling Judea. So, right. these families, the Alexanders, of course, had Philo, who was the premier Jewish intellectual of the era, and uh, the Herods had had converted, had taken. Uh, Maccabean princesses as their brides to try to breed a Christ, you know, this, this Paul. Exactly. And what's, what's interesting that you bring that up in Luke's genealogy, you actually find Hasmonean names like Matsyahu and Yanai, people who couldn't have been in Jesus's genealogy, but I think Luke put them in there to show he has royal genes, even if they're not correct. Exactly. David, and, right. And also to, to overwrite and confuse the readers. I mean, it's like, yeah, you know, um, if, if you look at the analysis I did of Simon uh, at the, you know, you have the conclu- concluding event, uh, which they put in John, which is is be- they put it there because it would be the end of the Gospels, not because it was originally written there. They had to move it. It was probably in um, Luke, I think, at the ending of Luke. And then they moved it to John when Domitian it came up with that kind of genre but they have the story where um you know simon and john uh are um uh, you know they they run into jesus and he says you know simon you're gonna be given to death to glorify god you're gonna be bound taken where you don't want to go and john here you're you're not going to die he, he, he uses a little cryptic language but so simon's condemned john is not and and you look at the um the conclusion of the uh you know, Josephus, the story of the, of the history of the war, same ending. You have uh, Simon and John are captured. They're the leaders of the Messianic movement. John is given life mm-hmm. imprisonment, mm-hmm. and Simon is bound, taken to Rome, and executed. So what they've done is they've taken the real history of this character, Simon. Right, right. And they have, you know, the word I would use is transmogrified to fit into this pseudo-history of the Roman uh Christianity. So mm-hmm. this is this is kind of how they they take they take history and reshape it, but with sure. tweaking it here and there so that it fits into the you know the theme that they really want to present mm-hmm. to the reader. Yeah, and what's interesting is it's funny because the English usually mistranslates it. I think the KJV does. Um, they translate his name as Simon the Canaanite when. Right. When it should be Simon, I mean, I guess zealot would be the proper word, but in Hebrew, it's like uh, the the zealots were called the Kanaim, which is very similar to like Kanani, right? The the yeah, Canaanites. It, it, it's obviously wordplay regarding zealot. Mm-hmm. I mean, exactly. What, why why would that not be the natural historical mm-hmm. way of looking at that term? It's like uh, another another thing that always drives me crazy is Nazareth. Uh, which which clearly is a pun, a play on words of branch. Yeah. Right? Now, why would this be completely, you know, the most concrete interpretation? Well, it's because Jesus is taken to Bethlehem to be born so that he can follow the messianic kind of right, path right. of David, right? Now, that's obviously the structure of the literature. And so And the way you- Luke gets him there is so hilarious. Oh, I know. Yeah. And and I wish people would I wish scholars would like talk about this more. Like if if <laughs> if there was a census nowadays and I had to go back to the land of my forefathers and he went back because David his forefather was from there, Joseph, right? If I went back you know what's that's multiple generations, 200, 300 years, I'd have to take a plane to Germany just to have my census taken. So well, I mean, half the planet would be traveling. Exactly. It's no, or, no one would be. Any, so how does this make it, sense? It, I mean, this is so ludicrous. Ridiculous. It's absolutely ludicrous. It's it's a, a fantasy that is just being. 
I mean, what they're really doing with that passage is they're just setting Joseph, the father of the Christ, up as a taxpayer. Yeah. They're just saying he's 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 like someone who went mm-hmm. to register so that he could be in the census we collect taxes from. I mean, it's just, you know, they have this subtle pro tax mm-hmm. kind I of, actually I have a theory you might like. Yeah. And it's regarding Judas Iscariot. Um I think he's actually a maybe not a polemic, but maybe a spoof is a good word against Judas the Galilean, um, who was very anti very anti-Roman taxation, right? Sure. Uh, amass quite a following, but yet you see Judas as this—you know—he's like the the disciples' treasurer, right? Right. And, I know. And it's he's kind of and he's really painted in this light that money's all that matters. Yeah. You know. So well, I think you can right. even it's... see some some like spoofy, like some spoofy play in there on these characters that they're showing, like kind of making fun of. It's messianic figures 100 percent, and this is the key is that if you flip the bit in your mind to start looking at the literature as humorous right mm-hmm. which is the way the authors would have looked at this material if you if you took this material and just gave it you know in, in a thought experiment to a bunch of cynical roman patricians what would they have th- thought of it right? mm-hmm. they would have thought of it mm-hmm. as a joke they would have said this is this is pretty funny Okay, well, that is the thought world from which the Gospels emerges. It is from mm-hmm. Roman humor that, as much as Jewish theology, that this stuff is coming. And so when you look at, um, you know, the, the, again, the, the last name of, of Judas, people wonder if they're actually making uh, some kind of a play on Saqqara, you know. the uh, Oh, I actually right. think it's something else. As yeah. I just mentioned, Judas the Galilean. Like I can't substantiate any of this, but I think it's actually taken from a Hebrew, like it's like a little play on Hebrew, and it means Ish Sheker, the false man, and that uh, they're really polemicizing uh, Judas the Galilean. You know, I wouldn't be a, well. I think that I think it is related to Judas the Galilean, even if it is a play on Sakari, and it is also probably because you know, sometimes puns can be, you know. Uh, different dimensions so it could, it could actually be making both comments with this with this but this is um you know like getting back to nazareth in in the context of the uh, ludicrous story about bethlehem mm-hmm. to think that it's just circumstance that jesus's hometown could logically the word could be seen as meaning you know branchville or the branch i mean this is someone <laughs> who's claiming to be claiming to be the branch <laughs> of David, right? I, I live near a branch, Dale, so maybe I'm the Messiah. Yeah, well, there you go. But I mean, it's just, again, <laughs> this is, you see, it, it's the, when you start looking at it as humor, these things become, I think, in, in the clearest way for interpretation. You know, you can now say, well, hey, this is just just like the Bethlehem thing is is typologic well, uh, sure. comedy of, sure. of, of a messianic nature. So so does Nather. It has to. Be. I mean, I mean, you have you have in the Pauline literature, he's quoting Greek and Roman playwrights and comedians and people who weren't like very, um, like in a Jewish context, being modest and you know guarding your eyes. And so that's that's a very important way to live your life. And Paul's quoting people who are quite vulgar in what they wrote, right? Yeah, yeah. So so you're seeing yeah. like more yeah. of a so I think that the the gospels and Christian the early Christian literature having this idea of comedy and almost like a play aspect to it, right? Something that could be performed on stage could make yeah. some sense. Yeah, of know? course. Yeah, and and that would you know it, it this could easily have been you know how how the um, how the material came into existence. You know, is is as as because. When they first brought out the story of Jesus, say, you know, in 90, 100. Uh, uh, you know, I don't mean to cut you off, but I just had a yeah. thought. Yeah. In the Colosseum, the Flavian Colosseum, did they reenact Titus's conquests? Not that I know of, but they often no? did. It, it wasn't recorded. Okay. But had they, had they done that, then, the, you know, the capturing of Simon would have literally have been a story right out of the Gospels, you know. Yeah. So, so this is, you know, I mean, they... Um, uh, the, uh, the, the way you're analyzing it is to be praised in my opinion, because yeah. you, 
you are open to the possibility of kind of a humorous foundation for the material. And um, this is, I think, a perspective from which we could make much more progress in understanding um, than, than kind of the serious, uh, you know, uh, like uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke as these uh, Jesus zealots and that they're right. looking at it as history. It's well, sure. I mean, of course I'm open. Even, even the Hebrew Bible, which I regard as true and from God, uh, I see humor in it, right? So how much more is something that might not be that, you know, in this context is is made for a different purpose, you know? So of course I'm open to that. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, so so there it is. It's um we have a literature that is uh um divine, designed to be very powerful in terms of its mind control. Yeah. Um right. and uh when Constantine started the process to make it the state religion. Um, he was also at the same time and with basically s similar proclamations as the Edict of Milan, he was establishing the feudal system. This is really, you know, kind of the the uh, the first kind of use of Christianity was to tone down um, the Messianic rebellion with the mm -hmm. mind control of a, a peaceful Roman messiah. But right. then it was reused uh, against uh, the European populations, as mm -hmm. you know, this would be their monotheistic mind control, where right. wherein God had given power to the church, and the church was run by the Pontiff Maximus, was which of mm -hmm. course was simply a title that Caesar used. So what happens is yeah. Caesar simply did not use the secular title when he was you know, in the public. He used his. <laughs> The title that he he used when he as the head of the Roman College of Priests as Pontiff Maximus, and what's right. just amazing is this and, is like a, a fact that that uh, people Soviet people are aware of. But if you go to the Vatican and you look at the huge uh, kind of square in front of St. Peter's, right, that uh -huh. has the obelisk in the center right. of it. Yep. This is literally the Flavian Circus. This is this wow. Place. This had been originally the circus where the chariot races were held uh, and, and uh, you know, Messianic rebels slaughtered wow. um, that uh, the Flavians um, used. And where you have St. Peter's now would have been, a, you know, a, a kind of a center of Flavian religious activity. So, you know, when you look at Roman Christianity, <clears throat> just mm -hmm. in its, you know, kind of like it's like the buildings. I mean, it's they didn't even they were so lazy they didn't even establish it someplace else. They just used the one that that they had currently right, going right. on and, and they didn't change the title. They kept sure. Pontiff Maximus. You well know, so. you well you brought up Julius Caesar, the Pontifex Maximus. Um let's even just look at those two side by side. At one point Julius Caesar was made he was never technically emperor, but he was dictator for life. Yeah. Right. Held the title of Pontifex Maximus, and after his death was deified. Right, he was said to be the son of a god. Yeah. Um, and the whole point of Hebrews, I think, uh, I want to say that's Hebrews three, maybe later, is to show that Jesus is everything. Also, he's the high priest. He's God. He's the mediator. He's the king. Right. So yeah. therein, you have this this total just mishmash of everything put together, just as you could be in Rome at the time. Right. You could be you could be deified. You could be the high priest of that religion. And you could also be ruling the country, ruling the world, in essence. Of course. And and as I point out in the book on Shakespeare, you can't really understand Revelation if you don't have that understanding of kind of Roman theologic history, because mm -hmm. just, as, you know, in brief, um, if you look at the angels that are described in Revelation, you know, you have uh, uh, the. Uh, um, uh, well, basically, the 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 five angels that that are presented are, you know, uh, the first five Roman deified Caesars: Julius Caesar, mm. Augustus, uh, Claudius, uh, and then um, Vespasian and Titus. And if you look at their descriptions, you can see that they these are pretty crude, but but visible um, kind of symbolic representations of these five Caesars. These are the first five Caesars that the imperial cult 
uh, had as you know registered as gods. And you know some of the connections between them. Once you have the sequence understood, like uh, they talk about the fourth one having like a, the, you know he he had the power of eclipse and there was you know like well this is because the day of Vespasian's uh, his coronation there was an eclipse of the sun so you have oh wow th these little historical things are uh, the second one you know they, he talks about he he's the one who had the sea battle and yeah right right fell into the the sea well. This is because uh, Augustus had the famous sea battle and uh, you know against Pompeii and and mm -hmm. the city of Alexandria was said to have literally been destroyed and fallen into the ocean. So when, once you have the history of the of the gods of the imperial cult understood, then you can see that what revelation is is actually describing is right, in fact right. the theology of the imperial uh, cult and and in fact, I've said in, in the book where I describe this stuff that you could almost just read Revelation uh, in, you know, kind of a, a religious sort of spectacle um, to members of the imperial cult who were aware of Christianity, and they would have understood it. Wow. They would have absolutely got this <clears throat> as a humorous way of representing the current Lord God, Domitian. Uh, Interesting. And his and his history, you know, as how he how he got here. So, hmm. that's that's very interesting. That's cool. That's cool. Yeah, I actually, I mean, um, one interesting part of Revelation. We can we can wrap it up because we're coming up on an hour and a half. Yeah. Uh, but one interesting thing I find in Revelation, um, maybe you've made this connection. I'm not sure. I know other people have, but I think it's pretty explicit. Is I want to say this is Revelation 12, I believe. It's not, it's 13, where it talks about the great port city that's destroyed with fire and the merchants watch from the sea and watch it be destroyed and all that. I can't help but read that as a retroactive perspective of Pompeii or Rome as a whole being judged and the eruption of Vesuvius in 79. Yeah, I mean, um, um, could be. I would, I would, in, in my analysis, I show that they are definitely um, taking the position that they know the authors of Revelation and you know this Roman writing guild. They know <clears throat> that their religion will be exposed at some point, hmm. and they are basically saying that when it is over we can kind of go back to where it was at the beginning and, you know, there'll be a new Jerusalem and everything will just, we will be, you know, in a kind of post Christianity world. So whoever is writing this material is actually making this kind of humorous observation, because remember they put the typology, you know, the, when you get into the typology of revelation and Paul, it's so complicated that right. I would say a lot of people will, not necessarily disagree, but we'll find my analysis. They they just can't follow it. You know, it's it's hard. Sure, sure. But, and it but, could but, it could even be as you're saying, just using events that are familiar right, to but, describe it. You know. Well, my, but my point is, is that but they they put the kind of simple Titus Jesus typology directly into the Synoptic Gospels. It's right there. Right. They, right. They recorded the you know the works of Josephus. These are important historical documents. They're handed down. To posterity, they not only uh, suspected that in the future Christianity would be exposed, they wanted it to happen. That's why they hmm. left the typology, because they wanted the legacy for having done it, having created the religion. To them, wow. this was like their, great, their greatest sort of achievement of mind control, of power, of, of Caesarship, right? So they aren't, they aren't hiding from, uh, you know, the uh, uh, kind of the the sense of, of, of what they are that people in, in the future would have of them for having misled people. No, but they rather are, putting their are, signature on it. Yeah. They are putting their signature and saying, this is our greatest glory. Because remember the, the Caesars had a different psychology than sure. normal people think. Evan. So, so anyway, this is, um, uh, this is why the, um, uh, you know, you, you, you have to, um, 
uh, look at like Revelation as, you know, when it talks about the future and about kind of the end and the, this reestablishment, they're, they're talking about their prediction of the future after the seals have been opened. Uh, I, I show in the book that the seven seals that are in Revelation are actually linked to seven seals that are hidden, you know, cryptically in the letters of Paul. Paul, hmm. just like Revelation, uses the term seal seven times, and they have this typologic relation, which ends up with the disclosure, basically, that uh, Jesus is Caesar. Okay, hmm. so so this is the um, uh, the future that they envisioned. And this is, uh, you know, when they when they talk about this post Christianity world, it's a world where, you know, people are, are relieved of the burden of Christianity, the mind control, but would have in its place the understanding of the genius of the people who right. who actually right. produced it. Um, Constantine, who made Christianity into, or began the process to making it into state religion, when he when he buried himself. Um, directly across from Santa Sofia, incidentally, in a, in a little church he built, he, he went and claimed and actually had representations inside the building of uh, religious um, icons from the 12 apostles. He actually hmm. claimed to have gotten pieces of their bones and stuff, and he arranged them. And in the center of that, he put himself. <laughs> oh, wow. So, so he, I think he's making a pretty clear representation as to who real, the real Jesus was, you see. <laughs> So, right. so this is, but you see, he's doing it with the understanding of the Gospels. He knew perfectly well what they meant. I mean, he, he, he was uh, related. He claims to have been related to the original Flavians. And so sure. there you go. Sure. You, you have, um, you have. So, the, I mean, he's, he's winning his wars, not in the, not the, in the, the power dual. of Jesus, but in the power of his ancestors. Yeah. Well, and, and also he's creating, he's, he's linking to the legacy. The legacy, it was important to them. They, this was, well, that's but that's the whole Constantine conversion story. Is he saw a cross up in the sky and won a war, but yeah. I mean, realistically, if if we if we look at that from your approach, he's drawing upon the legacy of his ancestors, right? Of course, yeah. I mean, that's all. So, that's all that that is, and and it's a story that was you know post hoc. It was written after the fact to try to right create exactly sort of a Christian legacy for Constantine seizing the throne, which could then be used as a plank in the establishment of Christianity as a state religion, which was done for the purpose of issuing in, in the dark ages where the uh, intellectual light of Europe was turned off so that right. the oligarchs would have no credible right, control. Right. And one more minute. I think this is relevant, though. I don't hold that Rome persecuted Christians the way people say they did. Where do you hold on that? Uh, they didn't persecute them. They prosecuted them if they did illegal things. There's a good book by Candia Moss, I believe her name is. She she wrote, uh, she went through this and said, look, there was no persecution of Roman Christians, which of course would be absurd, right? Why would they? Right. I mean, <laughs> Paul shows up and gets arrested by two yeah. Roman soldiers and pulls out his pulls out his id card and they say oh sorry we didn't know yeah. you were a citizen <laughs> and, and this is why the little little analysis i did of the of the historical simon and john and the, the christian version of it is so important because you can see that what they've done is the um persecution of christians right during this era was of jewish messianic rebellious christians they borrowed this history and claimed it as their own, even though it's incoherent to have done so. But it's not real. It, it, what they've done is they simply have, uh, you know, have, have taken over the real history and claimed it to be the lineage right. of the Roman Christians. Right. Um, which is, you know, if you look at it just in the logic of, of this era, um, there's no reason for the Romans to have persecuted the Christians, uh, the Roman Christians whatsoever. Right. Whereas there was every reason to have persecuted the messianic rebellious Christians right. because they were the ones waging war. They were the and ones gave the that, headache, exactly. Yeah, and people think, well, you know, you you have, uh, you know, one of the kind of criticisms that people bring to me is they go, well, Rome defeated the messianic movement. Why would they have needed to have created this complicated new religion? And they, they've already crushed them. And I go, look, you're not understanding the history of the era. Uh, read about the um, the Kittos Rebellion in 115. Right. Right, Bar Kokhba, and then finally the Bar Kokhba. Look at look at the Roman casualties during I mean, these things. 
the Gospels came out right in the middle of this process. Right, right. And, and so they, they, it was not concluded, the rebellion against Rome did not conclude in 73. It was just a battle in the war. The war went all the way through to 135 CE. Right. Yeah, it, it reminds me of the Servile Wars, where they 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 pinned up the, these slaves on the Appian Way for 13 miles. Um, and what it reminds me of, how I'm making that connection, is that didn't work. There were there were two more Servile Wars, right? Yeah. So yeah, I mean, it seems like they had to take a new approach and. Introducing they, passivity, as you mentioned, might have been their way of doing it. They threw the kitchen sink at, yep. at the problem. They they had right. uh, the Herodian Sanhedrin. I mean, <clears throat> Julius Caesar tried to uh, basically control the uh, uh, the head of the Sanhedrin. He wanted to like establish some kind of Roman agent in there right off the bat. Right. You know, and and so the, Rome wanted to control the Jews vis-a-vis -vis the religion. And there were various right. attempts at it. Um, the Herodians tried to breed a Christ. This was mm -hmm. this was actually probably the most plausible of the of the efforts. They they took Maccabean brides and then would take the you know offspring, train them in Rome, bring them back to yep. Judea, and say, "Look, here you go. Here's your Messiah. It's, you've mm -hmm. got the right lineage. It's all correct. Let's just." But the Jews weren't buying it. Exactly. And, and exactly. And so you, they they ended up saying, "No, nah, we we're not interested in in the Roman version of the Hasmonean lineage. We would prefer our own." If you don't yeah, know. right. Exactly. So, exactly. So there you go. And and um, but Christianity was it was the basically kind of the uh, Herodian version of uh, of breeding a Christ, just as a mm -hmm. literary uh, kind of project, rather than the the physical one that the Herodians tried that failed. Right. And what's interesting is, in conclusion. I don't know if you're aware of this. The Jewish sources, traditional sources, actually kind of confirm that as they say that Christianity is really an Edomite project that began with Edomites living in the land at the time, which yeah, is what I mean, the Hero that's, which that's is what the Herodians were. So that's, it's right. And that's they that that's that's suggesting the linkage between the Herodian Breed of Christ project with the Hasmonean princesses and the literary version and the gospels were the mm -hmm. same thing, which yep. I maintain they were. Yep. Very good. Well, all right, brother. Well, thanks. Joseph Atwell, man, I appreciate it. We always have great conversations yeah, when it you. It was a lot of fun. Thank you so much. I hope we can come back. There's so much more to talk about. Yes, of course. Um, but until next time, everybody, I'm Steve Eisenhower, Joseph Atwell, Caesar's Messiah. Check the description, always linked there. Um, this was the Exodus Project, and we'll see you next time, everybody. Bye bye.